for people that aren't familiar with you, it might be good to start, like, just have a wee bit of an intro to yourself. Like, um, you've obviously started with aesthetics, physical aesthetics, bodybuilding, right. and then you moved on to mental or spiritual aesthetics. Right, right. Um, can you speak a little bit about this journey and what drew you to aesthetics in the first place and then in how the it's progressed? Place, um, when I first started lifting weights, uh, I wasn't into aesthetics. I was more into like functions and you know, I was all about like power, speed and uh, jumping abilities and powers and stuff like that. And aesthetics was kind of like a byproduct. And then uh, after I reached my goal, I had, I had like the first goal I ever had in fitness was uh, I wanted to bench 300 pounds. So 300 pounds at 150 pound body weight. I didn't even want to get heavier. I just wanted to bench double my body weight. It didn't matter how much I weigh. Actually, I wanted to look as small as, as I can and lift as much as I can while being <laughs> as small as I can possibly to like mind fuck people. And then before <laughs> I never really think about aesthetics, I used to wear like really big t-shirts like to the gym so people don't see my muscles. And then I'll just like bench way more than like the guys are like turning 50 pounds. And then <laughs> I was like, I, get, I got a kick out of that. Yeah. and then i was like okay now i did the bench now i'm gonna do the squat so i squatted 400 pounds raw no belt no uh knee wraps anything like that and then okay i'm gonna do deadlifts and i deadlifted 500 pounds so it's it just kind of progressed from there and then after that i just i was just like you know i'm done with this power thing i'm done with the strength thing i'm gonna go on move on to aesthetics also i could ju- uh jump 40 inches that was another thing i forgot to mention it's like yeah, um yeah. i attained like a standing vertical jump for 40 inches standing vertical jump <laughs> Uh, I've seen a few it, videos of that. That's so impressive, man. I think that's the first video that really put me on the map in terms of like, you know, in the fitness community. And back then, it was like a really small community. It's kind of like the way like the, uh, the spirituality, uh, at least the pragmatic Dharma community or kind mm-hmm. of vocal, contemplative, contemplative fitness community is kind of like, you know, pretty small right now. And back then when I was into fitness, that community was like the size of the, you know, the Dharma community, the pragmatic Dharma, the hardcore Dharma community right now. So it's interesting how it's going to be interesting to see how this thing progresses. Yeah, and then after that, I started to move on to like uh, just just aesthetics because I saw Zeus. You know Zeus? No. <laughs> Zeus is like the first ever online fitness personality, but he passed away in uh, 2010. Yeah, but um, he was there before like Instagram and like Facebook and like you know social media influences. The year I really started, he was the first one that actually you know. I didn't even find him to take pictures of myself and post it online. And then I was inspired by him, not because of his aesthetics. I was inspired. I was inspired by how many people he could reach just solely by, based on his aesthetics and how people will listen to what he has to say, like his mentality and stuff like that, solely based on the way that he looked good. And then I was like, hmm, I got some, I got some interesting my fucking things to say. I want to my fuck people, you know, it's all about my fucking for me at that point. Cause that was when I transitioned after strength thing. I never really cared about aesthetics ever in my whole, my whole life. I was always used that as a means to an end. I was used that as kind of like this entrance point. Even back then when I was into like pickups, I was like, I had this mentality of, you know, people look at your aesthetics first, no matter how interesting you are mm-hmm. on the inside. The aesthetics almost like a, you know, a point of penetration, even if you want to, you know, mind fuck people, you know. So then uh, transitioning from like the power thing, the fitness thing, uh, I started reading philosophy a lot and philosophy of the mind, you know, neuroscience and evolutionary psychology mostly. Oh, damn, this thing just died. <laughs> Shit. Yeah. You got another one? I have another one. Let's see. I imagine you've got like 15 of the things. <laughs> I can't get any more of it, man. I don't know what <laughs> happened. You know, it's, uh, you know, I started breaking equipments a lot ever since I started meditating. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's, I, I don't know <laughs> what it is. It's, I don't know, consciousness is not inside of Daniel Ingram talked about how, like, when he was doing the fire casino retreat, he could, like, draw a circle, like, in the air, and then people, other people in the room could see it. Do you tell you that? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah he told it's, kind of, it's kind of yeah. similar, you know? It makes you question where consciousness is, right? Even though, yeah. like, on, as a matter of direct experience, it's so certain that like, consciousness is not like residing anywhere. It's not in the brain. It's not like in the mind. It's not even in objects. It's just there's no locality to it. But 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 um, still, you know, nobody can really say for certain um, where consciousness is. Okay, I got another card working. All right. So where were what was I talking about? Oh, so I transitioned from like the uh, the gym thing, the gym bro thing to like. Uh, philosophy i started reading about philosophy and then started to get really deep into like philosophy of the mind 
because I wanted to understand the mind and consciousness. And then I started doing some psychedelics. So it was like a two-year phase where I was experimenting with psychedelics on top of you know creating art and music, all that stuff is related, and you know really philosophy. And then once I started experimenting with psychedelics, I was like, you know, if you want to understand the mind and consciousness, it has to be direct experience. You cannot understand the mind through language or concepts or through reading about it. Um, if you want to understand the mind, it has to be coming from the mind itself. And then after a while of doing psychedelics, I was like, hmm, I want to access this naturally. So I started to get into meditation. And then I started to do TM. And the first sit I had with a TM instructor, I already went kind of deep. I was like, there's something to this meditation thing. It's a little different than psychedelic experiences, but there are overlaps. And it's way cleaner and you can control it. And I'm all about being natty too, like even fitness. You know, a lot of people think I'm on steroids, but I was, I'm also a big uh, uh, sort of proponent of uh, just being natural. Even though I have nothing against steroids or drugs, anything like that. Um, in the grand ultimate scheme of things, everything's natural, right? <laughs> yeah. Our natural is part of nature anyway, but uh, on a relative level, there is a difference. So, and I started getting into meditation really deep. And I went to my first retreat, which, if you're familiar with Dana Ingram's work, that's when I passed the arising and passing away phase, where I had a really profound spiritual opening, uh, spiritual high. And I walked away thinking, like, this meditation thing, it's way deeper than what I expected, what I signed up for. Uh, there's no turning back. And I was like, that, that was like a DMT trip. At that time, I only took like an DMT. And that experience was pretty much kind of like as powerful as like an DMT trip or a catamine trip kind of, you know. Uh, yeah, just, uh, just after that point, I started practicing like uh, about two hours a day doing the going kind of passion body scanning. And at that point, I still didn't know anything about stages. You know, I, I knew this thing called awakening, but that wasn't really my goal. I was like, okay, I'm just going to keep exploring the mind, exploring consciousness. And this enlightenment and awakening thing seems pretty interesting, but I wasn't sure if I wanted it. So my goal was never really to wake up or to, you know, be enlightened or anything like that. That, that was just like a little, it's like, you know, you can't ever really expect something. I never really, you know, uh, meditated with a goal, really. Just like in that moment, I wanted to, you know, upgrade my mind and explore consciousness in that moment only. And then after about two or three years of practicing going to the Pashan scanning for about, you know, I don't know, again, one to three hours a day, I went to my second retreat. And that was a retreat that, um, put me into uh, the, uh, the stream. Like I entered the stream and had my first fruition after accessing all uh, Ajanas on that one particular retreat. And that particular retreat was just insane. Like I, 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 think I couldn't remember much of it. The only thing I remember was like, the first retreat I was like, there was a lot of moments where I was like really calm, like really introspective, thinking about my character and thinking about my, you know, what meditation is. But the second retreat, like I didn't have time to think. It was just like one progression after another, one insight after another, one breakthrough after another. And by the end of it, after I'm done, I was like, okay, I, I, I've, like my perception has been permanently altered. That's when I first started experiencing the, uh, the panoramic vision, like the 360 mm. awareness thing. But there was still a bubble. There was still kind of like a constraint in, in which this uh, 360 non-dual awareness uh, was still like constricted in a particular, there was still a subject in here, a meditator in here, perceiving the object which is 360 degree and that there was a bubble and you know and then i started to deconstruct even awareness and even this what is this bubble they're not supposed to be a bubble you know that's um not a construct another fabrication and then i just went on and on and on until uh on may 25th 2020 when i i'm pretty sure i'm still pretty sure uh <laughs> that uh, i hit like fourth path on the uh in terms of the uh, pragmatic dharma map um, and then yeah. since then, there hasn't been, like I said, uh, there hasn't been like a quantum or a qualitative shift in perceptions. But uh, I went to another retreat uh, five months after that, which was two weeks ago. And then here I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's a few questions there. One of them that I want to jump into is um, this propensity to, to mind fuck people, sort of joke right. propensity of yours. It, was that what led you towards learning about philosophy of the mind and then eventually the spiritual path? And is it still, is it still with you? Or do you still uh, no, not anymore. That? Not anymore? Uh, no. Okay. Not anymore. Uh, I think that the, the, the thing that I enjoy about now is getting people to my fuck themselves. <laughs> Before it was like, <laughs> you know, me as Frank and this like amazing artist wants to my fuck people and they get a kick out of that. But that's gone. That's completely gone. Like yeah. I haven't felt like an artist or Frank Yang in like a really long time. But now it's just like this kind of like this intuitive uh, inclination for me to like share like 
the truth or whatever, the Dharma, you know, just to spread the Dharma in, uh, uh, in a way that would like entertain people in a way that would uh, not be boring, but it is not coming from the same place. It's not coming from the place of, oh, here's me wanting to mind fuck you for no reason other than just to mind fuck you. <laughs> now yeah. like, okay, I'm going to give you some pointers so you can figure out um, who you are, what you are at the deepest level for yourself and, you know, maybe attain uh, happiness independent of conditionings and all the good stuff that they promise to deliver in, uh, in contemplative traditions. And I can attest uh, from personal experience that all of them can come true up to a certain, uh, you know, you know the, the, of course there are degrees to this levels of realization, but uh, almost everything that I've come across that was promised in, you know, spirituality texts and meditation manuals, you know, pretty much came true as a matter of direct experience. Even though I can say also from personal experience that all those insights and realizations uh, could be deepened and there's no end to how, you know, deep to the unfoldment can go and how mature your uh, realizations and your uh, awakenings are. No matter how abiding they are, they're still going to be deeper levels for you to uncover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> you're, I think you're a really interesting and important voice for that. Um, on one level, you're you're a different generation to the likes of Daniel Ingram and some of the older folks that are Jack Cornfield and all these guys that have. Jack Cornfield, they're, they're great guys, man. Great guys, yeah, yeah totally. But just yeah. a diff- very very different format, and it's going to reach totally different audiences. So. I love the way that you present it. I love your video video editing with like the crazy 360 degree. Yeah, the 360, yeah. yeah and it's Fair so enough. sweet, man. It's so sweet. And um, and yeah, I think just your your voice is just is just unique. And you're obviously going to have a very um, it's going to be interesting to see how it develops with your audience because you've obviously built this audience with the bodybuilding and uh, the mind fuckery from you know like like a decade on YouTube, maybe is it? Nearly. Yeah been a long time right? I, think I started doing youtube 2000 i think the first month that youtube came out and i already had a bunch of videos like i, I yeah. always want to just feel myself doing crazy shit ever since i was like 14 even before that yeah, yeah. At that point i also had like an archive of crazy shit that i could upload and i was like okay this is gonna be my like in like archive that's gonna be like on cyberspace which i, I didn't have to worry about like losing footage so i started uploading some like just my my journey to fitness and mm. that progressed into philosophy and the my fucking and art and the performance art and music stuff, and then the spirituality, and then, like as you said, th- those three are really it, from the pers- from my perspective now they're the same. You know, ultimately yeah. they are just you know, different entry point into like the same reality. Of course, everything is right. Everything is just infinity, fucking itself. Infinity, <laughs> infinity itself. reality is itself. Um, uh, reality loves itself. That's that's what all the manifestations and all the um, expressions of anything in the world is just reality love in itself um infinity comprehending itself or people like to use the word absolute or whatever you want to call it mm. a god fab into itself you know it's just, <laughs> just one zero no thing uh yeah but then uh f- I, from the relative perspective um they're, they're quite different even if you if i see this thing that i'm doing right now just five years ago or like 10 years ago 15 years ago I would not like. I would think I was crazy. I would think this is this guy's lost it. <laughs> so, my, I think my my audience definitely have kind of like shifted. I've I've got I've gotten <laughs> a lot of new audience that are like really into the new stuff, and I lost a lot of audience. Which like it's nothing that could that is under my control. So like I'm not worried about that. I'm just yeah. Just, I, I used to worry about it, but now it's just like you know, it's just there's no could haves, there's no should haves, there's no would haves. That's one of the the insights are really crystallized on this retreat. It's like, there's no doer, there's no agency, there's no one in control. Uh, whatever is happening is happening. Another way to put it is nothing ever happened. Nothing is happening right now and nothing will ever happen from <laughs> the perspective of, you know, that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, I also probably five years ago would have looked at what you have talked about and what the likes of Daniel and Graham have talked about and just dismissed it as complete, like, craziness. Wow. <laughs> um, but I had a what, what's called an ontological shock experience with uh, okay. now now is known as that by by some people um with uh NNDMT in Berlin. If you okay, cool, cool. Um, Have you tried five meo DMT? I haven't tried five meo yet. It's uh it's tricky to get all sorts of things in New Zealand, <laughs> to be honest. And I'm a bit afraid of five meo. I have to um. Have I'm to still afraid of right now. You can really speak. You okay. <laughs> Breakthrough uh, on it twice. Yeah, uh, the last time was two and a half years ago. Even if you want me to do it now, there's still gonna be there's still gonna be like, oh, should I do this right now? Do I need? To? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 
yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to get into the the palette of psychedelics and and their sort of sure. slight pointers and insights in that in a moment. But um, yeah, just just for the audience's sake, it's kind of interesting to to reflect on the fact that yeah, five years ago, both of us would have thought this was crazy. But the fact that there is there are rational, pragmatic voices bringing this stuff to light and attempting to bridge the gap between like complete woo and spiritual language, which often is like very flowerly and very hard to replace with pragmatic rational language. Cause it's, it's sometimes it just, you know, doesn't work to replace those words and then complete reductionist new atheist materialism, which is what I, the school that I used to be in, you know, a long time ago, which is now I just see it's like, yeah, yeah, there we go. That Richard was the Dawkins, thing. The, uh, Richard Dawkins and stuff, man. Yeah, that was okay. the thing. That's my hero, bro. Yeah. Well, and, well, that was one of my first intellectual awakenings. Yeah. I read like the God delusion. I was like, holy shit, this guy destroyed everything that, you know, this guy was a deconstructor. And, yeah. But he hasn't deconstructed his own ideology, you know? <laughs> exactly. And you see everywhere once you get deeper and down to the path. It's like you see a lot of people deconstructing things. But then, uh, like I said, um, what was the thing that I said? Like skepticism are, a lot of skeptics are skeptical about everything, anything except for their own skepticism. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like nihilism is nihilistic about everything except that they find meaning in nihilism. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think spirituality and non-duality is really like deconstruction, uh, deconstructionism or skepticism taken to the extreme until like the mind itself <laughs> gets deconstructed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, if and you're still the deconstructing with the mind, with intellect, with like concepts and ideologies and philosophy, you're still within the domain of the mind. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. So it's, it's, it's just an incredible moment and um, nice to sit here in 2020 with this kind of, I don't know, I've been looking into metamodernism for quite a while and this does seem to be the like bleeding edge cultural trend of, of recognizing that there's truth in, uh, in modernism and postmodernism and truth in oh, yeah. like nearly every single lens and, um, and trying to synthesize a, a meaningful, uh, sort of path forward through all these different lenses rather than just getting stuck in postmodernist nihilism and just wanting to die, you know? Um, yeah. And I feel like that's probably where you're, you're, you're sort of sitting in that camp of it. And um, I feel like that's where I'm sitting and a lot of the people that I'm listening to and artists that I'm checking out sort of sitting there. So it's, I love it. It's such a, um, yeah, such a beautiful, beautiful lens, but I'm um, back to the psychedelics, which did you, which did you try before you had the breakthrough retreat? The breakthrough retreat. Like the second um, retreat where you had this, the rising and passing away. Oh, that's the first retreat. The first oh, retreat the first was the retreat. Oh, okay. Uh, that was a retreat that sort of uh, perpetuated me like purely into like the path. Right. Yeah. Before that I was still like kind of, you know, am I on this path or not? I'm still kind of ex- just meditating here and there. And then I was still kind of doing psychedelics, but I was doing a lot of psychedelics, uh, 2011 to 2013. And then after that, I just kind of, you know, psychedelics kind of hit like stagnated in my, in my development. Um, so there was a period like, so the first issue was 2015. So from like 2013, 2015, I was already transitioning to just meditation and, and out of like even books and psychedelics. Mm. And I've tried LSD, I've tried shrooms, I've tried ketamine, I've tried um, MDMA, uh, I've tried, and, and then DMT was the one that really, uh, pretty much like your, your experience, that was the, that was the experience, experience I had where I was like, okay, there, um, this, this materialism paradigm isn't ultimate, you know, before that I was still, you know, you could take, you could take a lot of LSD and, and shrooms and still be in the materialistic paradigm. Totally. Yeah. You know, Richard Dawkins Same. could be like LSD and he, and if his brain isn't already, you know, partially rewired through either like contemplation or like, you know, naturally through like, you know, you know, meditation or whatever, he could still be justifying the belief that belief that he had before. But okay. Yeah. I was right. There was no God, you know, everything is the brain thing. You know, it's a hallucination. It's all coming from the brain. Right. So, but, and then DMT was the one that really sort of, uh, perpetuated into like the, uh, the clinical, like the spiritual realm of a lot me, I don't really like using that word either, the spiritual realm, because for me, like the spirituality and materialism, uh, mind and matter, they all just, you, eventually you just send all those labels. Yeah. Uh, eventually, you know, you find that what I call the middle way. That's another thing I discovered on this retreat. It's like middle way 
Huda was so into the middleweight. He was like really big on the middleweight. Middleweight isn't just the point like in between two extremities. It's actually that point where it transcends beyond two dualities. Mm. So it's neither matter nor mind. It's neither, I'm neither dead nor alive. Everything is neither this nor not that. So, you know, the eighth genre is neither perception nor non-perception. So everything that is still fabricated in, within consciousness can really be uh, described and experienced that way. It's, you know, neither this nor not that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think I went off on a tangent. So uh, back to psychedelics. Yeah, so NDMT was like the thing that really uh, sort of put the nail on the coffin in terms of my thinking, like it's coming from like the materialistic scientific paradigm. Although there's nothing wrong with science. I'm not into science by any means. You know, I, I look at science as like a really pragmatic, really uh, useful tool within the clinical dream state. Everything that the science creates is still within the clinical dream state. Yeah, yeah. But it doesn't tell you anything about transcending the dream state. Yeah, Although yeah. the ultimate the dream state and the ultimate state is the same. Samkara is Nirvana, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, but even like physics, uh, physics, like, you know, quantum physics are saying a lot of the same thing that you can discover, like, from the first person subjective uh, perspective um, in terms of like emptiness and you know quantum physics and how like you know I was talking about the neither nor uh, it's kind of like you're in a state sort of like a state of potentiality so you know how uh, what is that called the cat Schoenberg's Sh cat Sh Schrodinger's cat yeah Schrodinger's cat you know he, before you open up the box where well, the cat is neither dead nor alive yeah, yeah, you know, that's yeah. kind of like, that's the middle way right there yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, quantum physics has a lot to say about, you know, the, the, the insights that, you know, kind of the tradition, uh, Finnish traditions have been saying for, for like thousands of years. Yeah. And I'd say, I, I think the meta modern perspective kind of sits there too. It's not really right. throwing in one way or the other. It's trying to, I, it's still trying to uh, be good in some way, I guess. Maybe that's not even part of it. That's, that's how I feel though. It should, it should still be trying to do. Trying to do well, what is the world. Meta, merit, meta modernism? What is that? So, uh, the last few cultural trends can be described as like um, modernism, which was like um, all the way up until maybe the maybe the seventies, eighties, Vietnam War and, and um, Nixon and stuff like that. That's when postmodernism started to really take off. But modernism mm -hmm. was like progressivism. You trusted the president. You left your uh, you left your keys in the car. Um, truth was real you know, pure beauty was real. Um, you know, the early Beatles stuff where it's like, Ooh, I need your love. You know, it's just all this like happy, lovey dovey stuff, fifties music. Um, then, you know, you get like Vietnam and you get like Nixon and then corruption. And uh, this is all very American centric, but this is also where I've been reading it from. Um, and then like, I think like perhaps the most, like the epitome of postmodern, uh, music an album would be radiohead's okay computer you know it's like a, a, what's it what's the song it's like a pig in a cage on antibiotics or something you know it's just like this like the world's fucked like nothing's true nothing's real can't trust anybody there's no it's a reaction towards modern yeah it's a total total reaction and 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 flip you know and it's this and it's very nihilistic and anti-religious and um mm. no truth no religion nothing's real so who gives a shit? That's kind of what postmodernism, um, and a lot of the art. There's like some beautiful music from postmodernism, and there's a, some beautiful, uh, some of the like TV series and stuff. Um, maybe Deadpool's maybe postmodern. You know, it's just like nihilistic and who gives a shit kind of a thing. You know, um, and it resonates. Like each of these periods, that the art that's produced in that period resonates within the culture, and it's often the stuff that the very edge critics are like raving about, and the audiences are like, it's really hitting them because it's this it's the cultural wave, you know, at least the bleeding edge. It's not um, the way I've heard it described is it isn't a hundred percent of the people that are feeling like this, but it's like the, the bleeding edge. And now we're moving into, you know, since the, maybe the two thousands, even, even then, or maybe even earlier, but definitely in 2020, we've got this like meta modernism, which tries mm. to, tries to bridge the gap between the two. Yeah. And, and oh, that's, tries to, all that's kind of like the, you know, uh, Hegel, right? Hegel. Yeah. So the uh, thesis, the antithesis, and then there's yeah. always going to be a, a new thesis. Yeah. So wait, synthesis. So you have a thesis. Yeah. You have a thesis. You have an antithesis. 
And then you have the synthesis, and that's yeah. how Hegel describes the progression and unfoldment of all historical events, all ideologies, all even just you know individual in, in, inside the individual's mind, society. That's pretty much like how things progress. And then with the synthesis, you get a new thesis. There you a go. New ground. There's a new antithesis, a new synthesis. It just keeps <laughs> going on. All the feet on each other, and this guy like this primordial like soup, and just like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so maybe this is the synthesis period, right? And um, synthesis to me is co the cooler one. I don't know. I like it. Um, so yeah, that's that's reflected in in some of the art and um, some of the music, and I could send you a few links of of what. And and the thing is, that it's emerging, right? So it's kind of difficult to define it. They'll better look back in like thirty years and be like, oh yeah, that was the metamodern period or whatever. But mm. as it's emerging, it's like you can actually pioneer it and you can actually be part of it. Yeah, I'd, I'd say your videos are part of that. And that's that's oh, what makes it, makes it exciting for for, for me. Um, yeah, so that's metamodernism, and that's that sort of sits uh, coming back to what you were saying. That sort of sits with this middle way, with this Schrodinger's cat of like right. neither here nor there, neither perception yeah. nor non-perception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, do you know Derrida? Derrida, uh, Derrida. philosopher. Yeah, the uh, the deconstructionist. Don't Derrida. know. Don't know uh, well enough to comment. No. No, uh, a lot of the postmodern uh, philosophers, uh, especially Derrida, um, they're kind of are really pushing the edge of the mind. But there's, it seems like they haven't, they haven't totally transcended. But they've got the right idea. Like they, they went to the edge of it. But then uh, they didn't have the right, I guess, techniques and methods or information like we do now with the internet. You know, we have you know, uh, the whole, you know, every single. Like book every single, you know. Yeah, the Library of Alexandria is here. In the tip of our fingertips, but they didn't have that, right? Yeah. And I felt like they were really pushing non-duality, but they didn't even know. Mm -hmm. Almost like, uh, do you know uh, this guy named Douglas Halfstadter? He yeah. wrote this book, I Am a Strange Loop. Um, but anyway, so a lot, even Nietzsche, a lot of those guys are pushing the edge of the mind, and they kind of went insane because they couldn't transcend the mind yet. They're at the edge of my, the mind, trying to figure out the mind. And then they're getting really close to non-duality, like intellectually. But of course, you can never really understand non-duality with the mind. You know, you, know, you have to be it. Yeah. So I guess this new like meta modernism period is like the internet has contributes a lot to this development, I think. Because you know, like I said, you have the whole history of information at your fingertips. And that's why we, I think it's a really sweet spot. A lot of people are getting into awakening in psychedelics because, you know, you can order psychedelics online. That's how I experienced with psychedelics. I ordered them online. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like, yeah. All psychedelic like, revolution and with the whole, like, now, like, more of the, uh, the mindfulness revolution, uh, the internet plays a huge role. And I think internet is kind of like the synthesis thing where it's, it's bringing things together. But at the same time, it's also, like, making things more fragmented simultaneously. Yeah. You know, so yeah. it's a really weird like place. Yeah, just like, totally. you can look at look at this world. You know, like the yeah. election, like coronavirus. It's like social media. It's like this double edged sword that just has it hasn't been able to. It's so new. It hasn't been able to like find a balance almost. And maybe that's the balance. It's like it's, it's inability to find like a, a landing ground. It's like we're totally groundless right now, and uh, which is kind of like what the awakening is. It's like you're in this <laughs> state where you're just totally groundless. You cannot. You can't even hold on to anything. There's no refuge that awareness can, you know, find itself in. There's no refuge that the self, either with a capital S or the small S that you can really ground itself with once you get uh, past this certain threshold. You know, everything's fabricated, you know, even consciousness is fabricated. You used to think that consciousness is the ground of being, you know, there's going to be a point in your spiritual journey where you think, oh, awareness, consciousness, uh, awareness is aware of itself. Consciousness is the ground of being, or even being is the ground of being, or even the power of now. But they eventually all that gets, gets deconstructed. But the difference between that kind of deconstruction and the intellectual deconstructing uh, deconstruction is that when you deconstruct everything experientially, you actually feel you actually feel totally free, mm. yeah, and totally loving and totally like you know fearless. But uh, if you only deconstruct things with the mind, there's still a ground, which is the mind itself. The mind itself is going to be the ground you're standing on until you deconstruct everything. Even emptiness itself is empty, you know? So there's really no body <laughs> in Jenna. But that gives you the total freedom, that nothingness, that is that nothingness that isn't even nothing, um, yeah, yeah. really gives you the total freedom to kind of, I don't want to say do anything you want because that's not the point. It's like, 
it, it's neither nihilistic nor um whatever <laughs> yeah, hard, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what i mean like mon monistic uh, or something. Yeah, yeah 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 so yeah i mean it's i suppose uh it's like trying to explain you could you could learn everything there is possibly to learn about sex about sexual intercourse yeah. and you could explain you can know it you know all the ins and outs and all the physiology and like what it's supposed to feel like and everything and you could tell someone all about it but until you do it you don't know what it is you, you yeah. don't really and yeah. same with some drug experiences and this is what i imagine it's like i haven't got anywhere near as far as yourself or daniel in the spiritual path so i've intellectualized a lot of these things as you say and i've accepted that a lot of the the, the dharma interests is, is they seem to be it sounds like about right but i <laughs> i have to put the work in to um to get there and and, and feel it and be it and, and myself so I'll, yeah, that'll happen at some point, I imagine. How, how long have you been on the path, like practicing meditation? Uh, maybe like on and off for years, for years. Like since, especially since that DMT experience, which was, oh, I don't even know how many years ago now. Um, yeah, and I've, yeah, I, I, I jump back on and then, and then I practice a lot and then I fall off and it's one of those things. But actually you inspired me to get more into it. I just did, um, I came back to New Zealand and did a, uh, had to do isolation in the hotel for two weeks. Um, and I did three days in there, just, just meditating and Vipassana and, and uh, listening to Jack Cornfield's Dharma talks and stuff. And that was, that was great. Like higher doses definitely help. Uh, it changed something with me, but I can imagine if you're doing 10 days of like, have you been to retreat yet? Time, you know, huh? Have you been to retreat yet? No, no, not no, yet. Cool, man. That's yeah. your next thing, I think. Yeah, sort of I think so. yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah, I think retreats are really crucial. Like, I think you you get you make more gains in one retreat than you do. And at least for me personally, I've heard other like practitioners said the same thing. You get more out of one retreat than practicing for like an hour every day for a whole year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something that, about like isolation that the fact that your you, you, your mind, like, because when you're like in everyday life, uh, you know, you're dealing with everyday life when you're, you know, not in like, um, when, if you have a meditation session, you kind of, you know, cleanse away the lens of perception. And then right away, you, you kind of get the dirt on it already just by, you know, going onto the world. So you kind of like, you know, taking one step forward and like half a step back, one step forward, half a step back. But at the retreat, it really gives you like the right condition to like take 10 steps forward and no steps back in a sense. You know, that's <laughs> yeah. how it feels like that. Yeah, because you're just putting away layers after layers after layers of the lens of perception, and it, you did the retreat like condition. It doesn't give you like that opportunity to like, um, sort of, uh, put the put the lens back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just keep yeah. the lens off. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I'll just book one in. I think that's just the way. Just book one in, like in six months or something, and just do it. I think that's you can just do it by yourself too. Like I, yeah. but are you guys still, you guys, you guys not in lockdown anymore, right? No, no, no. New Zealand's pretty much everything's happening here because there's no COVID. Are you in school or in work or anything like that? Or you go to school? Uh, I, I make music and uh, oh, cool. I produce music and I play music and I um I do this podcast as like as like a passion project on the side and I uh yeah throw events and stuff like that. Electronic yeah. music and stuff like that. Yeah. Neil makes music too. Huh? Daniel makes music too. Yeah, I think he does like shreddy. A lot of shreddy people stuff. that are really into music and art, like that's their next progression. Even though it's not like better or worse, not like higher or lower, but it's just like eventually, if you do this music thing, if you dig deep enough from you know even philosophy or art, you eventually find yourself in the in like the sphere of uh, oh, what a place is. Yeah. yeah, totally, totally. Because it's all about exploring consciousness, really. Like if you're aware of it, you're doing music, you're exploring consciousness. Yeah. 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 And you play violin and piano, right? Yeah, yeah I play the violin. Yeah, yeah you're amazing. Violin. <laughs> you know, I kind of lost the motivation to play, yeah. play music. Really? Uh, the, yeah, a little bit. Like, there, there are bursts of moments where I feel like I'm really like motivated and passionate to like play music right now. But it's, it, it, it's not coming from the same place as before. Before it was like I was trying to construct this this identity of like this artist, this musician, but that's gone so nowadays just like you know sometimes i'll be like really passionate about music and i'll play like in a moment and i'll enjoy it way more than i did before same with fitness actually same with any kind of hobbies that i used to have like honestly it's like everything that i wanted to gain out of those 
like hobbies or those you know interests in like art and music philosophy it's right here right now like 24 7 yeah and then uh and because and then i could i can take this this thing and then go back and play music and play music was way more in, becomes way more enjoyable or even like drawings and stuff is way more enjoyable than before but then uh Ultimately, uh, I, I'm not driven to play music that much anymore. It's kind of like whatever I do, it's almost like driven by the universal will almost. Because mm, mm, yeah, after a certain point, you don't get to make a decision anymore. Yeah, it's just like everything is happening on its yeah. own, you know. Yeah. You feel like there's like a, a loss of autonomy. It's just things aren't A little bit, but at the same time, I felt the most free ever. So it's a, it's a weird paradox. It's, it's really hard to comprehend. Yeah. Um, it's like you're not in control at all, but at the same time, since you're not you anymore, that's not even a question that you ask yourself anymore. It's like you don't think about it. You know, you're, you're not gonna be like, oh, fuck, man, I lost my autonomy. I used to be motivated to do this. Now I'm not. Right? There was a phase that you know that, that was still bugging me, but even now that's gone. Because yeah. if you even question yourself, that there's still a subtle sense of duality in there. You know, there's still a subtle sense of self in there that's that hasn't been like dissolved into like you know emptiness or whatever you want to call it. Mm. But it's noticed? really like yeah. Sorry, yeah just like just, when it's uh, going you, you out, go, you, you, you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, just going out and taking a walk. Um, it just feels like literally every step that you take, it's like you can feel that it's viscerally and experientially. It's like the whole universe is doing its thing to make every step that you take like out of perfection almost. Uh, and every step you take is dependent originated, arising from like infinite webs of conditions that are connected to infinite webs of conditions and on and on and on. And then, uh, but then at the same time, even that is, is a construction. Even that's a fabrication. Even dependent origination is, is fabricated. Even the Dharma is fabricated. <laughs> but then, you know, like I said earlier, that, that's not like holistic at all. It actually gives you a total sense of like awe and freedom. It's just like, what the fuck? Just like you're, just like you're, the fact that you're, like you have perception right now the fact that you're conscious right now is like the most magical thing that you can ever imagine right so everything falls under that umbrella just like the present moment the fact that there is even like this thing right here right now it's like it's the greatest piece of art like you know anyone can ever dream of yeah, yeah just, you know god created itself yeah or, or nothingness <laughs> creating yeah. itself vibrating into form which is also empty emptiness in form the same <laughs> <laughs> that that's so you go full circle that's like kind of what, like what i wanted to say like you go full circle you like spirituality for me is uh having your cake and eating too you get to do all the things that you used to enjoy but you're not attached to the outcome you're not even attached to the process you just kind of do it to do it and uh yeah that's pretty much how it is <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have you noticed like a, a performance increase or decrease in music and in like working out and lifting or anything like that? Anything changed uh, in, your, in your creative capacity or in your performance capacity in either of those? I think like, it increased, but I don't practice that much anymore. So like I, I can say for sure, like I'll say that nowadays when I play the violin, just to give you a concrete example, uh, I probably practice like an, once a week and I'll say my skill pretty much stayed the same. Whereas before I, got really into meditation uh i have to practice like almost every day to keep up like you know to mm. not go rusty but nowadays uh i can just play the violin like once a week and still maintain that same level wow so just by that standard i think uh in, in a way it increased but just because i don't work as hard on trying to maintain anymore it's probably like still stay the same, yeah, okay. but I can imagine if I, if I want to go back to like practicing every day, like two hours a day, like I did before when I was like peaking in the violin uh, or like fitness, I would, if I go to the gym, I go to the gym like three times a week. If I go to the gym like every day and really have that mindset of wanting to make gains, I think without a doubt, I'll surpass my like old, like PRs. Yeah. Okay. Because I think a lot of our energy goes into maintaining a separate self. You know, mm -hmm. once that's released, like you have so much more freedom to like focus on like whatever you're doing. And also a lot of your uh, energy goes into um, the outcome of things. You know, what people think gonna think of you or, or what are you going to think about yourself? You know, are you performing well? All that's gone. So like um, if you take the freedom, if you take that sort of like the, uh, if you don't have that energy to, if you sort of release the energy of worrying about those things um, and just purely like pour it into like, your creation uh i'm sure like you know you 
you're surpassed your like your old levels. Yeah. But a paradoxical thing is that you're just not driven by that anymore. You know. Yeah. 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 That's the interesting thing. So there's like a um a much much higher uh, free flow of energy, whereas like right. the, the same the same like base energy would have been there before, but a bunch of it was just getting like blocked and pushing right. into blocks and like f- moving into anxiety and just creating a lot like shitstorm that you know might reduce your capacity by twenty five percent or fifty percent or even more. Yeah. And now that that's all gone, it's just like pff, like yeah. So and also like the mind muscle connection thing that's important both in music and in fitness like i yeah. feel like when because there's absolutely no separation between the mind and body uh or anything else just like one thing just one zero thing to like like the metaphor that i like to use is for this state is is god dj into itself because since you like like being music it feels like every sensation and when i say sensation uh sight sound you know, thoughts, emotions, bodies, your body, other people's body, the cars outside, the sky, everything is like vibrating together. Mm. Um, it really does feel like, you know, you're, you're just kind of like, you're, you're, you're just DJing reality. But it's not you DJing reality, it's really reality DJing itself without <laughs> a point, without like, you know, coming from here. And it's pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, so my mu- muscle connection definitely increased by like a shitload after um, you, you dis- dissolve the duality between mind, body, and brain, or, or, or the body, and stuff like that. So that's that. <laughs> <laughs> and also, well, this is one more thing that I want to say uh, is that um, yeah, it's almost like I forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> That's another thing. Like, my memory is kind of fucked right now. <laughs> Your memory? Yeah. All right. So, I don't. I don't remember the past that much anymore because that's one of the things that really like deconstructed is like the passage of time. Like there, there, there really is no time. Like I realized before that you know time and space are fake natties, but I didn't go so deep into it that time and space literally don't exist right now. <laughs> right. It's like. Yeah, before you still kind of stand on the ground, okay, the past doesn't exist, the future doesn't exist, I can kind of see that. But there's a present moment, there's the power of now. But even the power of now doesn't exist. Because if you try to grasp onto like the single frame of the now, you can't. And also like past, future, and present are codependent arise, arising through each other. If there's no past, there's not going to be a present nor a future. If one of those is gone, all three is gone, mm. right? So like whatever the now is, is just some uh, transient you know, sensations going in and out, coming in and out. But even arising and passing away is sort of like a midway stage. Even impermanence is sort of like a midway stage because without time, there's nothing that's arising or passing away. Yeah, so, because like process, like cause and effect uh, doesn't even exist anymore. Because cause and effect and processes still exist under the presumption that there is time. And without time, there's no space either because you need to have the container of either time or space for those two to like be embedded within each other. So without space, there can't be any place that time can exist in and vice versa. Right. And then that goes to no self too, like the relational nata of no self without time or space. There's no place that any objects or any sense of self could exist in as an object. Yeah. (laughs) Mm. So pretty trippy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's like kind of two schools, two major schools of time, right? There's uh, eternalism and presentism. And eternalism is kind of this block universe theory where the past exists and is real, the future exists and is real, and the present exists and is real. Same, Andre said it's the same way as that France is another place than we are right now, but it exists. They would say, eternalists or block universe would say that the past is a a mm-hmm. concrete thing that's like eternal but in another place and then presentists say the only thing that exists is this like plank second momentary thing right right, right. that like nanosecond that doesn't even exist yeah exactly that you you can't even really it, grab it yeah but you are you saying that both of those don't even really seem to make sense anymore i, I i'm saying both of them ha- are are it's, 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 again, it's neither that nor that. So it's like yeah. both. Yeah. So, you know, Einstein, who was like the, he was pretty much a block universe guy, right? 
I believe so. But then at the same, yeah, I think he, he was. But at the same time, he said past, future, and present are illusions. Mm. So Einstein was kind of standing in that middle ground, you know? Mm. Yeah, so if you say that past and the future and the present all exist simultaneously, that's the same thing as saying none of them exist. Right? Because mm. the, the, when, when all three exist simultaneously, which you can, also, you can kind of experience that too from where I'm standing. You can experience the past and the future and everything existing right now. But that's the same thing as saying none of that exists because you know, that's the same thing as the saying there's no like, movement, there's no passage of time. When, all, when in fact, the universe is a block, uh, uh, a continuum or whatever, when everything is already existing simultaneously, right? That sort of presupposes that there is no such thing as, uh, as a passage of time or, or yeah. space, yeah. right? Because space presupposes like, a, like an order, like a distance. Right, and um, and that's one another thing that I sort of deconstructed is the uh, the sense of distance. It's like everything is like closer than close. It's like the sky right now, or like you know, um, just whatever I look at the building outside. It's from the perspective of you know of awareness or consciousness, which has no location. It's closer to quote unquote me than my breath was to my nose or my heartbeat was to my heart, like when I was identifying with being this separate character. So nothing really has a distance. And then reality, just this seamless, like gapless, like unfoldment of activities, you know, pure perceptions, pure sensations. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> I think Daniel will understand. <laughs> yeah, it's early. Space and time are just sensations. Like whatever you perceive as the passage of time or space are just you know, trans transient sensations that are, are ultimately not arising nor passing away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, let's move on to the, uh, the threefold path or whatever it's called. <laughs> the yeah. or, morality, or, morality, concentrate and concentration. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Let's um, do that. Yeah, so you got we got morality, concentration, and insight. And as far as I understand it, uh, concentration and insight can be perfected, and that's potentially the state that you're in now, and the state that Daniel's achieved as well. Um, but morality can never be perfected. Right. That's like a, a lifelong project. Um, would you say that you've you've at this point you've perfected concentration and insight? Uh, I well, if you, I I don't think there's an end of concentration either. I think you can always become more concentrated. Even if I, or anyone's access all eight jhanas, if you access all eight jhanas and have a fruition, pretty much you have quote unquote master concentration. Yeah, but right. within each jhanas, you can still be even more concentrated on that particular jhana. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so I don't think concentration has an end either. That's why Daniel keeps going to like Casino retreat, right? Like, mm, like you okay. know, like you can always you know have more cheerful visuals and you can be even more concentrated. Um, there's no end to it. Um, but like, but after you perfected the insight axis, uh, after you have completed the awakening axis, which is one of the three silas where I, I, I'm pretty certain that there is an end point mm -hmm. because when reality perceives itself thoroughly and directly, um, that's it. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing more or less you can add or take away. Right. And it's actually everybody's present moment experience right now. Mm -hmm. And it's staying for everybody, like, you know, under all circumstances, you know, all universes almost, but at least that's what I feel right now, having this, uh, this kind of awareness. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just the way things are. And then uh, you're just taking away, you know, you, you, you're, the, the only reason why you would want concentration is so you can deconstruct the mind, so you can sort of cleanse the lens of perception and even use concentration to take away the lens itself. So you can, you know, have this, and so after you have this, a concentration isn't that big of a deal anymore. And that, that's one of my, the, the things I let go of actually on this retreat is like the attachment to uh, formless realms. Because before this retreat, I was still really, really subtly was attached to certain jhana states. Uh, certain states that are like, oh, this state is more holy and more spiritual than this state. This state is better than that state. And if, if my body mind feels a contraction, I'm like, holy shit, I'm not in that state right now, am I going backward? There's still a really, even though like ultimately I know, you know, the state is permanent, there, there was still a really subtle uh, attachment to 
like this formless realm or like you know the highest genres whatever uh and one of the things that kind of like goal of this retreat is that um, jhanas and samadhis and even like kundalini stuff and all the energetic stuff um it, it doesn't touch this like whatever like you and i have right now but you have to go through that process you kind of have to exhaust every stage to be able to uh disidentify from them all and uh now so nowadays uh that's one of the, the major differences between post retreat and pre-retreat on this retreat is that before when I feel constructed or contracted, if you know, if there's a sense of self still get constructed, which uh, you know, the sense of self is gonna come and go. It's gonna be there. Even like uh, at the eighth jhana, you're still gonna have a, a tiny bit a sense of self. If you if anyone tells you there's not gonna be a state with there's no sense of self at all, they're deluding themselves, because the only state that has zero sense of self is the ninth jhana, which is total secession, which the whole universe disappeared. That's the only state that isn't fabricated. Every time you have a perception of anything, there's still going to be a very subtle sense of self. Even if the self is a capital S, it's like, oh, this is the Brahman thing, you know, the self is a capital S, there's still going to be a very, very subtle sense of something, right? A sense of perception. And then Buddha said, any kind of clinging, any kind of, um, even perception is a form of clinging for Buddha. So that's why he, he said, you know, you know, the ultimate is, that you can't even comprehend it. But then once you can sort of let go of, you know, any kind of grasping as being like you, then it's okay to, you know, contract. You know, if my, my meat suit contract, you know, if my biological organism, my, you know, my mammal suit, which is going to be here until the day, you know, I physically die, it's going to, based on conditions, going to act one way or another. You know, I still have to shit, I still have to eat, I still have to, you know, do all this kind of stuff, like human stuff, right? So, but now I'm totally disidentified with it. Even I can contract into like a tiny ball right now and then I still wouldn't feel like it's it, it that has anything to do, with, to do with you know my clinical natural state mm. so mm. Uh, went on in a tangent and uh, yeah no, and, no, dude, I, I, yeah. All, all yeah yeah so so I I would say that um the insights axis uh definitely has an endpoint but like I said in the beginning even if you've realized inside access to the endpoint there's still going to be more refinements that you can do so ultimately speaking, there's no end point. Mm -hmm. But also ultimately speaking, there is an end point. <laughs> <laughs> That's a seems to be a running theme of this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so there's um a, a potentially a wrong word point. there, like mastery would have been a better word. As you said. That's probably also the word that Daniel actually used. Uh, not necessarily oh, mastery of the all three axes or mastery of uh, of concentration and insight doesn't mean it's perfect it just means that you're at a master level and then okay. the uh the, mor the morality training is something that you can never master it's something you can always improve on yeah uh, yeah and that's i agree so how, totally. how how do you approach how how do you approach morality training and how's it going for you uh nowadays i do like meta sometimes but i do it from the perspective of emptiness like i don't do like oh i'm I, i'm sending happiness and i wish the other person would be happy I sort of just, um, I sort of just find the underlying like you know formlessness of everybody and just abide in it, and then like naturally like love and compassion will flow from it, um, because if there is absolutely no separation, it feels kind of artificial to sort of reconstruct the separation just to do meta. From from where I'm standing right now, and uh, right now it feels like there's really no other right. There's no other. There's no, there's no, there's no self here to wish the other to be happy. Um, when I look at people, I don't see egos. I don't see selves. Like even when I see Donald Trump, I don't see a self or an ego. I just see like you know the the doing of the universe, uh, and there's just absolutely no separation. And even though on the relative level, you you can dislike someone uh, because of their personality, but at the deeper level, you know that there's absolutely no separation. Is every experience is the universe loving itself is reality you know making love to itself and that's kind of like my meta right now um so i you know ever since the retreat i haven't really tried to do anything in terms of morality uh, and i think after that last shift i had on may 25th i guess morality after a certain point you can look at it as like a sort of like integration work but um in my experience uh there's nothing to integrate after after that shift because even if there are things to integrate, even if the character would do certain things to like, realign himself to the truth, to like, you know, non-duality, whatever, from the state of duality, um, 
if you want to make that distinction. It doesn't feel like it's 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 done like intentionally. It just it, it doesn't feel like you're doing any kind of work. It doesn't feel like integration. It doesn't feel like you're actually putting work into perfecting your morality after a certain point. It just feels like everything's just happening by itself. And uh, I, I'm not sure if this is a cop out, but so far I haven't I haven't run I haven't ran into any situations where I have to question my morality yet. So <laughs> mm, mm. yeah, so so far I haven't really you know um, found myself in situations where I'm like hmm, this I need to I need to reconsider my ethics or anything like that. And mm. Okay, that's interesting. Hard to, hard to put into words. Yeah, yeah. sure, sure. Because there's, you know, there's like, uh, there's like the effect of altruist cats, you know, like they're trying to do the relief of, you know, the most effective relief of suffering for, for humans, I suppose. But maybe also just like the biosphere or whatever. But they can with the, with the you know, if you've only got $10, what's the most efficient way you can spend that money? Um, what's the most uh, effective charity or whatever? Um, these guys have this prerogative that they want to do the most good that they can in their lifetime with the time that they have and the mammal body that they have. Uh, and it seemed like that was what the Buddha, uh, kind of wanted, like the Buddhist thing is to, is to release the suffering of all sentient beings. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And the state that you're at the moment, like, I'm just curious, like, how do you measure if you're, you know, if that's, if, is that some, is that part of like what you intend to do? Do you even have intention anymore? This is like where it gets a bit confusing. And if you do have that intention, how do you measure that? How do you tell? Mm. Right now, the, the, like you said, there is no, there's no intention to me, for me to want to do that. But right now, like just doing this podcast, you know, hopefully I'm spreading the Dharma, right? Mm. But, you know, that's something that you can't tell me. I'm like, okay, let's do it. That, that's yeah, pretty yeah. much it. That's yeah. pretty much it. Or if I make a video, like during the retreat, I recorded some videos. I haven't, uh, haven't edited them yet, but I, I've been uh, just recording my insights still throughout this journey. I'm still doing it. And for me, from my perspective right now, it doesn't feel like I'm doing that for, neither for myself or for other people. It just mm -hmm. feels like I get an impulse to do it and I just do it. Um, and if I, if somebody asks me a question, like, you know, on Instagram or whatever, uh, I reply. If I see it, I reply. That's, that's pretty much it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then apparently people find that helpful. Like, um, I get emails all the time. Like, you help me so much, but I don't feel like I'm helping anybody, to be honest. <laughs> I don't okay. feel like I'm helping myself. I'm just doing things. And then people come up to me and they're like, you know, I, you really helped me on this and that. I'm like, thanks, bro. But I don't think that's me doing it that much. <laughs> Right. It used to feel like it's still kind of self-interest, you know, based a little bit, like during mid path. It, it, it was kind of, kind of like, you know, in the between when I was moving from the mind fucking phase to the spirituality phase, there was a phase that I felt like, huh, I'm, I'm kind of just like, you know, you know, blasting those insights that I got from meditation, sort of like in a self-serving kind of way. Um, there was a stage like that, which, you know, everything I, I did before was self-serving. Before you deconstruct the self, everything you, you're going to do, even if it feels altruistic, it's still going to be somehow self-serving. Right. But then after you totally deconstruct it, and, you know, dissolve the self, uh, nothing you do would ever feel like it was for you or for other people. Do you know what I mean? And I'm not, I can't say for sure where Buddha and other people are coming from. Uh, and I'm not sure if this like kind of mindset, which is not really mindset, could change later on. Um, but just so far right now, I can tell you from like direct experience moment to moment that it neither feels like I'm doing anything for myself or for other people. Hmm. But apparently there are people who are benefiting from it and I haven't heard anybody so far. So, yeah, so yeah. far I haven't really That's felt okay. like you like contemplated and kind of like, you know, dissect, well, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. How have your, how, how has, uh, how has this entire experience affected your relationships with like family and friends and loved ones and, the topic of love itself is a pretty interesting one. And maybe you could talk a little bit about maybe how you experienced that before and afterwards as well. Uh, love in terms of like romantic love or just family love or love in general. Oh, what do you like? Mm -hmm. Where you uh, not much feeling of romantic love left. Yeah. And uh, in terms of family, 
there are definitely some moments where it feels like you know I'm being a fraud. It was like I'm I'm you still know, staying with my dad right now, uh, and then like, and I'm eating the food that you know our maid cooks and stuff like that. And it feels like, wait, why are you cooking for me? Like Frank King is no longer here. But that that even that's gone. There was a, there was a phase where it, it kind of feels like that, but there was still a really subtle duality there between thinking that I'm not Frank King and thinking that I what well, was like before this and that. But I don't think about that anymore. Um, so now it's almost kind of like just very natural. It's just like the way things always work. You know, it's just like everybody is in their own state. Everybody is perfect the way they are right now to me. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're my dad or if you're my mom or if you're like uh, Ryan or it's just, um, you know, everybody. To, to me, okay, here are two ways I kind of put this kind of the way I experience it right now. There are no others. There's only quote unquote God experiencing itself and there are no enlightened beings at all. And all individuals are imaginary. That's one way to uh, sort of state this experience. Another one is to state that everybody's enlightened and everything every, everybody does at all times is the expression of truth and love and beauty. Yeah. And uh, in terms of love, there, um, I mean, I, yeah, there, from a relative level, there's not much inclination for romantic love, even though I'm in a relationship right now. Uh, my partner is, is, is pretty much in the same, kind of this similar state as I am. So we, we kind of sort of understand where each other's coming from. So, uh, I mean, on the relatively, relative level, I mean, there are moments where I can still kind of feel, you know, romance, but it's, it's very subtle. It's very subtle. It's mostly just this kind of this universal, like, um, connection, just like the stuff that I, that I described before, just reality, reality, love in itself. Mm. And that way, under all circumstances, in all relationships, yeah. I experience. It's maybe, hard to explain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I don't talk sure. to my family about this. Actually, like I don't tell my mom about this. I don't tell my dad about this. They kind of know uh, what I'm going through, but we don't really talk about it. So it's not like I, I, I went up to them and sat there and I'd be like, you know, I've experienced this like transition to no self. I don't feel like your son anymore. Now I'm nothing. <laughs> right. and, like, I'm eating your food and I feel like I'm a fraud. That conversation never took place. It's just like, it's just unfolding on its own. And right now it's just, it's kind of like, it's almost like you're back to square one in a sense. Like at the end of the path, it feels like you're back to square one where nothing, ever, nothing changed, but everything changed. Yeah, it's it's during the mid path that you sort of like have this like you know alter states of consciousness and like, um, because there's still in the mid mid state you still feel a sense of like merging. You still feel a sense of like oh, there's this divine love, this divine universal consciousness that this character has to merge with. And if he's not merging with it, he's suffering, and um, and that's when you get into a lot of trippy energetic stuff, the Kundalini's and like the jhanas. That was like really important. But after that, after you even like go beyond that. You kind of just everything just seems pretty normal, but at the same time, it's totally different. Yeah. It's almost like this. It's almost like hmm, I think the best way to describe this is like before you started the path, you, you, you're you're this person, and then you're looking at like a, a, an aquarium, and the, the, what's inside this aquarium is like where you want to be at, where you read about your spirituality, right? And then during mid path, you kind of put your head like in the aquarium, and you're moving around like with half of your body inside the aquarium. That have your body still like in a relative wall of the humans. And then at the end, you, you kind of cross over and now you're in the aquarium. There's not a single like air bubble inside the aquarium. You just kind of sink into like the state, right? And in, in some sense, that, that the state that you're inside the aquarium, the state of you inside the aquarium, it's almost the same as the state outside of the aquarium. If you think of like what's inside the aquarium is not really being anything different from what's outside. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? But then now you're experiencing this aquarium as an aquarium. But before you were experiencing an aquarium as a human being. But it's mm -hmm. the same aquarium. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the kind of like the best way I can describe it. Mm. Yeah. So any kind of changes and transformations uh, in terms of how you feel about love and like romance or like family and all that stuff, that that's that's a that's a quote unquote problem or dilemma during mid path. Mm -hmm. After you get to the end, it's almost like the same as how you would deal with things before, but just from like a whole different holistic perspective. Okay. Like you can still play the role of the human being, but this time it's just, it doesn't feel like, doesn't feel like it's you doing it. It just feels like that's the right situation to do. Like if I'm in front of my dad, I'm going to play the role as a son. 
if I'm in front of like, you know, my friend who doesn't know anything about spirituality, I'm not going to talk to him about spirituality or no self. I'm still going to act like I'm Frank Yang. But this time it really doesn't feel like that's Frank Yang. It just feels like, okay, in that right condition, just the way that the universe is unfolding, uh, I'm acting that well right now. But it doesn't even feel like it's, I'm intentionally doing it. Mm -hmm. Which is yeah. almost the same as before because before nobody's doing it anyway. Nobody ever had a self, right? So yeah, <laughs> again, it's like the same but different. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that's what Shakespeare meant when he said the whole world's a stage. Everyone's just, just performing and doing these things. It, it's a stage, yeah. But that's a funny because funny thing because I think... It also uh, isn't a stage. <laughs> <laughs> Neither a stage nor not a stage. <laughs> yeah, right. Somebody asked me, somebody asked me uh, just yesterday that he said he just went to his first retreat and he said well, after he came out, everyone feels so fake. They're acting on a stage, right? And I'm an actor too. And I feel really disconnected. And I feel like everything is fake. And then like, you know, why do people even talk? And then I said, I felt the exact same way after my first retreat, but there was still a very, like, pretty strong duality there, right? Between like, what's real and what's not real. What's on the stage and what's not on the stage. Is there anything behind the curtain? There's nothing mm -hmm. behind the curtain. Yeah, the background is the foreground, is zero, is infinity. There's nothing that, there's no mask that put, people are putting on. There's not even a face. Like every, every, there's no like, oh, true self. And then you put two layers of mask in front of this person and then three layers of mask in front of that person. And now you'd be fake. Now you'd be more real. All that, like, duality, <laughs> dialogue is all. There, 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 there is no foreground or background at all. Yeah. yeah. Things just the way it is. Like, you know, it's just the way it is. It's just, this is it. That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, one more thing on love is there's this felt sense of love that usually like people often feel in the chest area, like not where the heart is. Um, you know, if you've got self love or if you've got romantic love or love for a family member, they're often in the same place. Um, and you're saying you're experiencing the universe experiencing itself or loving itself or this, you know, how, what's the felt experience of that? Is it, is it, it's, is it non-local? Is it like not no longer uh, bound into that heart space? That's a, that's an interesting question. Um, I think all love, even if it's the capital of love, like the ultimate love and the relative love, they're actually the same thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like at the end, the relative is, a, is the absolute, right? So like the, the Mitsu is still here. So the way that the Mitsu uh, interpret like this universal uh, absolute love uh, is it, still going to be somehow filter through this, this Mitsu and there's going to be conditions where the Mitsu is going to have certain reactions toward that, right? So it could still feel like it's in the heart, no doubt, like mm. once in a while. But it's, it's, it's very subtle. It's not like the predominant thing, right? And due to whatever biological makeup that humans have, for some reason, when we feel love, it's coming from the chest. I agree with that. So that's still there a little bit due to conditions and however our like my body organism is evolved. So there's still going to be a sense of a certain very subtle sense of, I don't want to say contraction because it doesn't really feel like contraction, but the, the sensations could be located somewhere in the chest still when you feel that universal love, but that's in the background. Like what's in the foreground, um, relatively speaking, is, is very diffused. It's like, um, yeah, it's not local. It's just, it's, it's almost like an, it's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say it's a feeling. It's, it's, it's almost like a recognition. It's almost like a, um, and then through this recognition, through this comprehension of reality, like love in itself, uh, like I said before, the, the, the organism is going to react and respond to it in certain ways. And the degrees of that could be different from situation to situation. Uh, and like, I mean, I can still get sexually aroused and I, it's not like I don't feel it in my penis. You know what I mean? I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, no, it yeah. totally does. Totally yeah. does. But the, uh, the, the chances of you feeling any kind of like feelings or emotion in the, in the body localized, it's, it, it gets more and more diffused yeah. as the unfoldment deepens. Okay. Uh, the the, the body is, is totally holographic, but, but within this hologram, there's still going to be some solidity here and there. Mm. But that doesn't mean that solidity isn't empty. It's just more, it's just sensations that are a little bit more congealed, but it's still seen as, as utterly empty. Uh. Alan Watts once said, there's a price to increasing consciousness. We cannot be more sensitive to pleasure without being more sensitive to pain. Do you agree with this? Uh, I think or does it not make sense from your <laughs> maybe uh, it doesn't make sense from your vantage point? 
I think from time to time that that could still be the case. Yeah. But uh, like I said before, like because this 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 thing is just so there's no size to it almost. It just it just doesn't it, it, it doesn't feel like pain or pleasure that much anymore. Yeah, but the, that that makes a lot of sense mid like mid path though. Uh, definitely there are instances where I, I'm super conscious of all sensations and the negative ones gets even more negative. That's where the dark night kind of comes in. Mm. And then the, uh, the pleasant ones are even more pleasant. So there's, there's still a duality there, but there's still a spectrum. But I'm not sure right now if that's gone or it's because it's so diffuse that I haven't really thought about that. Like I haven't really felt pain in a long time. And maybe that's just because I haven't really <laughs> encountered anything like really painful yet so far, but I could say that all the things I used to like uh, gave me pain and suffering are now, if you want to quantify, uh, pretty much reduced down to like one to five percent. Not even maybe not even mm -hmm. five, maybe like one percent. And again, I'm not sure if that one percent is the reduction of something or is because like the recognition of something like so infinite that all the other relative stuff just gets swallowed up by it. I'm not sure. Mm. Yeah. Okay, that's that's super interesting. Yeah, I was curious if you'd like stubbed your toe or you know just done you know got kicked in the balls somehow or you know I had something that would be normally quite painful if that's been reduced significantly and yeah one percent. Oh yeah, yeah, that, that, that's like, significant. Yeah. If, I, if I hit my toes and then uh, I I could kind of just kind of pull back and and abide in like infinity and it won't hurt as much. And it depends on if you want to. You know, sometimes you still there's still a certain uh, sense of contraction automatically towards the pain due to survival and you kind of have to work for it to, you have kind of have to work still work to like pull yourself out of it um i remember susan young you know susan young right i think he answered a question kind of similar uh, uh somebody asked him if he could go to the i think something along the line with if you can because there's this like enlightened master that go go to the uh go to the dentist and he doesn't need any any uh, uh yeah, yeah, yeah. any more like that right and so i think shizhen yang someone asked me some of the questions he said sure i could do that but i just don't want to put in as much that much work <laughs> if you want to give me <laughs> work, I, I might be putting words in his mouth but something along that line of yeah he still feels pain if you know conditions rise but he now he has that capacity to completely not maybe not completely completely because you know we still have the human body but we can maximize that you know that ability to really uh detach yourself from it yeah. which is yeah, but at the same time, you can still go back to it. You can, like, anything that's pleasant, you can still enjoy it to the maximum degree. So there's a spectrum that you can play around with. Yeah. Like I said before, anything that you could feel and access before, you can, you can still access and feel yeah. at this stage. You still got a brainstorm. Now you, yeah, you have the flexibility and, the, and sort of the freedom to kind of you know, pull away or you know, you know, go into your pain, yeah. things like that, yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, here, here's one, like, talking about morality a little bit again, so, there is, there could be an immense sense of detachment and, like, no fucks given for bad action in your state, I imagine, which is yeah. basically psychopathy, if we're putting it in, like, human social terms. Um what is it do you think do you think it's like the values that the character frank yang was brought up with and inherited that keep you from doing bad or just doing anything good or bad just being a chaotic agent in the world because who cares like it, like you're playing grand theft auto or something right um you know i'm just i'm just curious if others reach the state because there's obviously a lot of like bad gurus and a lot of like right, good right. gurus, right? Is it something to do with the preconditions coming up to that? I'm gonna I'm gonna move to my my room because the the construction site is killing me, bro. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh shit! The construction thing. I can't even hear it, but um. So that's you can hear it? Really? It's really noisy when I'm standing. Okay, I'm gonna move to this room. I think it'll be better. Okay. I think it's more quiet here. So, all right, intermission. 
<laughs> oh yeah, Bear Grylls. Okay, so uh, I think I think I think uh, I think I think re reality is it's pretty much always in harmony, and if you recognize reality completely, it's very rarely that you do anything that go that goes against this flow. For me, any kind of um, harm that you would do to another person, it, it's it's coming from the, the place of contraction and separateness 99% of the time. Um, and those gurus that you hear about, it's, I, I'm not sure. I think, I think, I'm not sure. I think a lot of them, like, depends on how bad their actions are. A lot of them, like, I, I, I would think, like, just out of so many gurus, you only hear about a few cases. And, None of those cases are really like horrible, horrible. You know, they kind of just you know they, they get horny and they want to fuck their the students and things like that. And uh, I don't, I'm not sure. It's hard to say. Hmm. But I would say like in this state, like I, I can only speak from personal experience. You know, I don't know uh, what other gurus are feeling, but um, yeah, you just kind of automatically rely on yourself to harmony. And if you don't, maybe those gurus are liar. Maybe that's the way they perceive things. Maybe for them, that's harmony. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm really not sure. Yeah. Because if you get to this state, almost nothing you can do that isn't going to be harmony anyway. So just like this Franken character's ways of harmonizing itself to like reality, just, it's just not that yeah. so far. <laughs> You know what I mean? That's what I mean. Uh, and I, I, wonder if yeah. that's, I wonder if that's from the earlier Frank Yang and like the upbringing of Frank Yang as compared to someone that might have had a different upbringing or different events or different trauma or whatever. Right, and then they right. also reach another state and then it, for them it just feels harmonious. But they're just... Cool, cool. Imagine. They might not even be necessarily completely bad, but they could just do whatever the fuck they want and it, there's no action on their conscience. That's that's yeah. just a curious thing and I, I, I'm I'm curious about it. <laughs> they have in their heart or their mind it, it's perceived under their state to be totally harm harmonizing with you know itself so it's really hard to say mm. yeah okay yeah i get that question a lot it's really hard to answer that question it's, yeah, it's really tr really tricky because you, you can never know what like you know what state the guru is in you know what, what were they thinking or how they're feeling it's, it's, it's really hard, hard to pin down. But all I can say is the human organism is, 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 is fucking complex. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, you're still going to have this biological meat suit. And you know, how this meat suit respond to, to um, like awakening, it's, it, it, that's another complex issue that's really hard to pin down, why people do certain things under what state and for what mm -hmm. reason, how they're feeling during, their, during those acts or before or after. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt, like I think most of those gurus are they they they're like they're, they're spiritual athletes, like they're 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 Olympic athletes in terms of like you know meditation and stuff. They de they've definitely accessed some states, right? And then and uh, yeah, just may maybe they they need to work more on morality and, and maybe not working on morality is part of their flow, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's really hard to say like what's going on there. Yeah. You, we talked about 5-MeO DMT before and you mentioned that even now you'd be like nervous going back into that state. Why? Yeah. I, why? I don't know. Just like, uh, just the, the, I think that the body, the, the body mind still, because like a 5-MeO five, five DMT trip is still a mind state. Like whatever trip that you get out of it is still a mind state. And that question, it's almost the same as asking if I would get nervous if I see like lion coming. Mm, okay. Yeah. I'll be going on the roller coaster. I, I think that's going to be the same because it's it's still there's still like you know you know mind states and and like this day it's it it's not a mind state. It's not a, really an experience per se. It's almost like the uh, uh, the source that gives rise to experiences. And uh, whatever experience that, you know, you're manifesting, there's still going to be a difference in how your body might respond. And maybe it's just conditioning because, you know, I, 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 I was pretty nervous each time I do 5 mm -hmm. <laughs> And so, I mean, it's kind of like the way I, I got nervous before this retreat. I was, you know, what? I, was, I wasn't nervous about, I was nervous mostly about like, you know, activating like jhanas and, and samadhis and different other states and, encounter entities but all that stuff is like i said it's kind of like in the relative domain of the mind 
Yeah, but I wasn't like I wasn't afraid like going even deeper into like emptiness because emptiness is just the way it is. Um, you, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Because once you, I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's hard to explain. Yeah. yeah, it's like for most people, I imagine it's the opposite. Yeah, you know, they they will be afraid of the annihilation of the self and and, and true and glimpsing true emptiness. Um, more than like you know, having an experience of psychedelics or, you know, riding a roller coaster or access in jhanas and things like that. Yeah. Also because like in this state, like all the jhanas and all the samadhis, they, they're not always that pleasant anymore. It's almost like they're, they're restricting and they're, they're kind of, they can get really, really intense. And like Daniel said, like Daniel said, he went to a fire casino retreat and then he said like he was stuck in this ayahuasca realm that like he couldn't find in his bodies and like he couldn't even get out of. Yeah, so like I was like, mm, I don't think <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound too fun. <laughs> yeah. Are you familiar with quality of computing? And the mm, no, no, no. There are um, there's some friends of mine in the Bay Area that are um. Their their kind of mission station. Uh, their mission statement is um, to reveal the computational properties of consciousness. And uh, yeah, they're they're a dynamic, very very smart, very interesting group. Um, and actually, I discovered you through a Facebook group that I'm a part of, and someone posted your video, and, and uh, that's how I found your first video. So uh, was that I, before you found about Dana Ingram and the pragmatic dharmas, or after about the same time? Or uh, no, quite a bit after I after I encountered Daniel. So I encountered Daniel via Slate Star Codex, which was like up until recently was like one of the like uh, shelling points for the rationalist community online. Uh, Slate uh, Scott Alexander, who who is the author of Slate Star Codex, wrote a book review on mastering the core teachings of the Buddha, and Daniel is kind of like you know associated with the rationalist community. He sort of speaks in that lingo and. Uh, it's, it's very bright and um yeah so i read the book from that recommendation and then i talked to daniel and subsequently daniel i've managed to introduce daniel to the quality research institute guys and they're doing some work with them now which is cool uh and then yeah in the, in the group someone posted your video about awakening and i watched that and thought it was fucking awesome <laughs> so, so that's when I, that's when I wrote to you. Um, but I did ask Andres from Quality Computing if he had any questions for you, and he had he had two related to some articles that he's he's uh, released. One is the pseudo time arrow, which I think would actually take an entire podcast for us to explore. So I I won't do that one <laughs> today. Um, but the other one is five meo DMT versus nn DMT, and they've got nine lenses that they've observed. And just curious on your, on your uh, opinion on these. So there's, the first is uh, space versus form. It says 5-MEO is more space-like than NM, NNDMT. Um, crystals versus quasi-crystals. 5-MEO generates more perfectly repeating rhythms and hallucinations than DMT. Non-attachment versus attachment. 5-MEO seems to enable detachment from the craving of both existence and non-existence. Whereas DMT enhances the craving. Are these are these uh, and, uh, comparisons fitting in your experience so far? Do they make sense? Um, um, I think, and then DMT was definitely a lot more formed. The, there was there wasn't a lot of space. There was just a lot of geometric shapes. And then for for uh, and then DMT for me was still a dual experience. It was like the frame came in mind was still intact and was experiencing the and then DMT world from the outside almost. And I could still form thoughts, and I could still, you know, it, it almost feels like I was transported into another realm instead of it happening in my mind, like what like an NMT felt like for me. And 5 ml DMT was just—I think that was my first glimpse. I, I wouldn't say it was true or non dual experience, because I don't know if you watch my videos on psychedelics. I, I, I don't think you can really truly glimpse non duality before your brain is wired for non-duality. Like mm. you could like you could be a dual state of mind and then take five ML DMT and think that you have glimpsed non-duality. But there's still gonna be some subtle sense of separation because you're still perceiving that drug trip 
from the lens of perception that you haven't cleansed out. So I think that was my experience with 5 mo It was really close to a true non experience, but was mm-hmm. still wasn't like non like right now. So that's why I keep going on about the fact that in a sense, this state right here, it's more powerful than both of those experiences, mm. but also more subtle. So, so 5 mo DMT, yeah, with, if you want to talk about space, it was definitely more like I, I could glimpse the like the panoramic like awareness 360 thing and everything's connected kind of thing. And then it was just um, the sense of space was kind of just was like infinite. It was almost like, you know, there, there was no boundary to anything. There was no boundary between me and the room and the person sitting in front of me. Where in a DMT was still kind of restricted to like that there was a, there, there, it was almost like a room that I was in, almost like a, that was the, I could sense a location. But then for family DMT was just like there was, more like a sense of non-locality but still it wasn't like true non-locality yeah can you go a bit more into the in, in detail about the yeah the difference difference between true non-locality and the 5 uh the if difference uh, well i think when i was when i was on 5 meo at that time i still haven't entered on duality like naturally so there was still a sense of oh it's i'm having this experience it's, it's me, Frank Yang, took a drug, and then now he's seen the truth. He's seen the truth of non-duality. There was still that sense of separation. And it's very subtle, but it's, now thinking back on it, it's there. But now, now this day doesn't feel like, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't feel like your, your consciousness, is, before, the, the five year DMT should feel like the, your, my consciousness was still in my head at that point. But then there was something more to it. There was like, Oh, it is connected to the consciousness that's outside of myself, but it was still coming from my consciousness connected to that other consciousness, even though it was connected, right? But in a true non-local, non-dual state, that even, there's none of that. You know, there, there's just experience is just experience. There's no freaking experiencing infinity even. There's not even a sense of penetration of, oh, now Frank Kane's body, which is empty, is being penetrated by the universe. That's what the Pavio you know, did felt, felt like. It felt like there was, there was a sense of, um, still a sense of like penetration and sense of going in and out of something. But that's a very a sense of merging. But like I said before, that's a very subtle form of duality still. Yeah. And uh, for, for this state, that it doesn't, so this day doesn't really even feel like there's a sense of merging or a sense of you know you know penetration. It just feels like yeah, it's just very. It's actually very simple. It just experience is experience. Awareness is awareness. There's not even a sense awareness is being aware of itself. Even mm. it's like even just say even saying reality is love in itself. It's 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 already creating something there. It's just the reality is just reality. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So, and then within this, this, this field, um, you can't localize a, a self anywhere. It's like there, there's not, a, pin, there's not a, a particle within my mitsu or in my experience that I can pinpoint and say that's the self. But during my five-year meal trip, because I haven't entered non-duality yet, I haven't had any kind of direct realization into emptiness, I could at that point pinpoint that I'm Frank Kent here having this five-year meal experience. And even though it feels like Frank Kent is, is experiencing infinity, it's not true. It's not really truly non-dual. Um, and even in a lot of like mystical unity states, you can still, if you haven't recognized anatta or emptiness completely, you can still, the self can still be transmuted into that experience as being like the self with the big S. Uh, in a very subtle way, most people don't even realize it. Um, you can still have a really profound mystical experience and be like, oh, there is no Frank here, there's no self. But then you, you, in this very subtle way, you're kind of transmuting that sense of self into that experience as in like, oh, the Brahma is the self or the, uh, it's the Atman, it's the, uh, um, you know, you know, Leo Gura? Nope. <laughs> but anyway, so you're, you're, you're kind of misinterpret like, you know, the experience as being like the new God or like the awareness, the consciousness as being the new God, but in a very subtle kind of what you're attaching the sense of self into that experience. Mm. And in, in this day right here, I can't even pinpoint like the most mystical experience to be like, hey, that's the self. There's no self for the small S, but that's the self. I can't even have, there's not even a feeling of that. So I think that's the main difference. Mm. Yeah, that, that can only experience, speak from personal experience. I'm not sure how to experience it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But then on an NDMT, that, that's, that duality was like even stronger. It was just like, 
you know, I was like the, the, the Frank in mind was still in here thinking about that experience, like that, that, you know, whatever, you know, space or room, whatever geometric uh, space that I was in, it seems like it's two, to, two totally different things. But on um, five minutes, at least, it was like, sort of like, oh, it's, even though there's still a duality, it's connected. Mm. And on my and then DMT trip, it didn't feel like it was connected at all. It feels like I was watching a TV or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure it's, yeah. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds subtle, but like a lot of what you've described requires direct experience. Yeah. So there's, only one, there's only one way for us to find out, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The yeah. There there is a big sense of duality with DMT and also ayahuasca. Have you done ayahuasca? No, I haven't done. It. That's the one thing I haven't tried. Yeah. I heard it was good for like cleaning up and stuff. It's good for like you know even after. Oh yeah. Like, uh, yeah. You, you done ayahuasca? Yeah, I've done it done it a few times. In the first session, like. Yeah, that was a proper hard work cleaning session. Um, but something weird happened after the after the first DMT trip. Something weird happened. Like I saw humans without. There's like some kind of filter that you see, like normally, like well, I see humans as like, oh, that's my friend, or that's whatever, and it's got this like friendly filter on it, or this like dangerous filter, or this like neutral filter in it. But it's still like a human. It feels like a person. But after that first breakthrough with NNDMT, the filter disappeared and then the humans just looked objectively like what humans look like, which are fucking weird. Like the, we're the weirdest looking animal on the planet. Like these upright, you know, pale creatures with big eyes and the clothes on. Like I just didn't have any identification with them as humans or people at all for like two weeks. It was really, it was really disorientating and like, yeah. So you were seeing them like in real life, just walking around? Yeah, yeah. Like after the after that experience with and DMT, like the, I had a crazy um kind of entity experience with that, and then oh, wow. felt really good like that night. But the next day, I was in Berlin and I go on like the subway, and I just see people, and it's it's as if you're watching watching a film about aliens, and they look really weird, and you've never seen this like type of alien before, and you're like, man, those things look fucking weird, and objectively, humans are fucking weird looking and we act really weird like in comparison oh, yeah. to the rest of the world. Look at us from our perspective, we're fucking weird. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's how I saw everyone for a few weeks and I, yeah, it was quite um disorientating and quite uh made me feel quite alone and, and a bit crazy for a while. But uh that was years ago, but I've integrated that since then. Um, wait, let me get my, my wire. My 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 camera went off battery. Yeah sure. Here we go. Oh yeah, she, like one one of the, the meditation teacher I really like. His name is Shijin Young. Oh, you should check out his book. Yeah. You should check out his book, The Sci Science of Enlightenment. Okay. Yeah, you like it? It's it's he's kind of like a like, dominus, but not really. Uh, but like being about this guy's not serious. Um, he 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 wrote a lot of experience where after. He, he went to a retreat or something. He was seeing like insects everywhere. It's kind of like how you describe it. Because he was just seeing like huge insects out of size of like just in the subway or on the street in his house and things like that. So when you saw those entities, like they were humans, but then you just perceive them as like from an angle. Uh, so okay, so I had an I had an entity experience on NNDMT that was like the mama pancho spirit or whatever, which I had like up until that point, I was like, my friend was like, oh yeah, you're going to, you might see entities and spirits on this experience. And up until that point, I was like a reductionist, materialist, atheist with a slightly agnostic, but mostly that. And I was like, yeah, okay. And he'd been telling me about his experiences. I was like, I was like yeah, I just I can't believe that until I try it. And then I tried it. Uh, he got me through break, breaking through firstly like he turned into a lizard like a lizard person like an argonian from oblivion if you've ever played that game he turned into like something like that and like a smiling lizard holding me this holding the pipe i was like okay <laughs> that was just the first hit and then by the time i got to the third um yeah i like could barely even breathe or remember my name or anything and then uh he told me about this this 
what he what he believed was the um the mother spirit or the mama puncher spirit or whatever which a lot of people seem to interact with some some sort of a like archetypal mother spirit on dmt and ayahuasca and i asked him what was their name and he said mother and i said mother and then this like crazy like amoeba looking cell spherical thing like came through the ceiling and like immersed me and like cuddled me and like tried to calm me down with so did you have a sense of like actual reality during that time or is is it like laced on top of actual reality laced mm-hmm. on top of reality somewhat um was like like between- still, I, I was still in the room like in the bed uh-huh. where i was lying down uh but the, yeah i mean, mostly had my eyes closed um yeah, and she hung around for like fifteen minutes and like blew my fucking mind. Like just, and just afterwards, total, total, total ontological shock. Like. Sorry. After the trip, you were still seeing them. No, that so that that entity went away like just slowly, just went out the ceiling, and then I had like a nice afterglow. The 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 weird human thing was just just normal people that I was seeing on the street. They just looked like a like. They looked what humans actually look like, not what they look like through my lens oh, that's, of that's friendly humans. Yeah. So how long did that last after the trip? When I mean, you just see people and you see it. So <laughs> everyone you feel like that or just like some people? Everyone looked like that for like two weeks. For like two weeks. Uh, how about the other objects and like animals and like buildings? What do they look like? Everything else was normal. Just humans looked, I had just totally lost my identification with and uh, fil- filtration of what humans are or like people. I lost the, the label, you know, the filter of people. They were just weird mm. animals upright animals yeah. well, well what about your own reflection on the mirror like when you looked at yourself i think i had that same sense as well for me which was quite so was it was it like a clear sense that you were kind of hallucinating or did that seem like it was like real real that wasn't a it wasn't a hallucination it was just a different perception um okay so so so, the, so if you look at if you were still in that state if you look at a person they you, you can still see the color of a human the form of a human but they, they look perceive- exactly the same like the, oh, they look the, exactly the same but then just uh, it's kind of like a difference in view or perspective not like yeah. a form kind of it's, it's not like an oscillation form it's more like a perspective yeah 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 mm-hmm. perspective shift it's oh, like you've never we- seen humans before and you land where- on an alien planet and you're like and you weren't a human yourself and you'd seen all the other animals on earth and then you land on this alien planet. And then there's like these upright walking things with clothes on doing all the human stuff. And you just feel like, what the fuck are those things? That's I, I think it's very similar to um, what uh, I was experiencing after my first retreat or when I, when I said that guy asked me like, you know, how do you deal with like seeing people just acting on a stage? But like yours seems more like more on the extreme side of things. It's just like, there's a certain sense of deconditioning in your in your mind of what humans are supposed to be act like or act like, and then once that condition was kind of pulled from underneath the rug, you know, and you started seeing it differently, although they they appear the same. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what about you? Like your, the percepts, the perception of your yourself. Like, um, did that change, or like, were you perceiving other people as like, oh, they're from another planet, but I'm human, or were you also that 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 animal, like, like? I had the whole thing going on that I thought I was the only thing in existence and that everything was a projection of myself. And Mm -hmm. uh, I felt completely alone and quite crazy. Like I lost, because my whole worldview was built on on reductionist materialist atheism, Mm -hmm. you know, and and that's what kept me grounded. And then I just got completely destroyed. (laughs) And I didn't have have any tools to rebuild it with like my friends were new agers. Like I love them. They're still a bit like that. And that's, that's all good. But friends were new ages and then my other friends just didn't have the capacity to talk about it and then the other friends that i that maybe could have helped me rebuild that were in new zealand and i i managed to sort of integrate that when i went back to new zealand and talked to them uh, about it yeah so it was like a kind of like god like that god experience kind of a thing so would you say you went through like a dark now of soul yeah maybe maybe a, a yeah like a it wasn't so bad that I was, you know, it, it was bad, but it, I managed to come back from it. But, um, how did but you I integrate? Could how, I could see how, pe- yeah, I could see how people could break. Like, I could see how people could properly lose their tether and just, yeah, I think you did a pretty good job. You look, you, you sound like you definitely integrated it. But, like, I have a friend that did ayahuasca, and then for like, he's still like depersonalized right now. And yeah. then, like, my recommendation to him was for him to do it again. 
I think like even with meditation, you can go to retreat and get stuck in dark night phase. And I think the best way to break through is if you go to an, another retreat, because you can get stuck there and like you know sort mm-hmm. of like a no man and then not get out of it for the rest of your life, even unless you kind of like do the same thing to push through it. Which is what happened to me actually. I think I was pretty much depersonalized for like two or three years after my first retreat, even though I had that uh, spiritual high. Of course, after you have a spiritual high, you have a spiritual low, and like that's where the dark night comes from, like the spiritual lows, you know, the sort of like this depersonalization phase where you kind of glimpse no self, but you still had a self. Um, you kind of glimpse this other thing, but you still like one foot is still the other. One foot is still in like the solid world and one foot is, uh, is in emptiness and then you just kind of have to push through it mm. and even people go to retreats and if they don't push through it they not just i not just ayahuasca not just psychedelics even on retreat even for meditation it's the same thing it's like you can get stuck in that plane for for as long as <laughs> for for definitely times until you kind of uh, do the work and kind of penetrate through it integrate it or or break through it yeah uh, yeah and i can there's like different levels and how detailed people can become and some of them end up in, in asylums and some of them it's very mild and they get through it and in my case it was yeah it was like shocking and uh disconcerting but um yeah i managed to i managed to integrate it by just investigating my own worldview as much as possible just exploring everything and and essentially like i don't know i think everyone should write their own manifesto of what they believe is reality what they believe the worldview is like what they believe is right and wrong even if it's even if they're not sure about it they should just write it and uh, update it accordingly i think writing helps a lot yeah didn't jam again say it again you know Jim McKenna? Terrence McKenna? Dennis McKenna? Jim, Jim. <laughs> Jim McKenna. Jim, Jim, Jim. Your, your video is frozen, by the Is way. I, I don't know if it's, if it's... Is my video frozen on your end? No, but it's the connection is weird. Yeah. Right, so weird. where were we? What were we talking about? I forgot. We were talking about integrating. Integrating oh, yeah. uh, Dark Knights. Yeah. Dark Knights, yeah. And we were talking about... Um, I, I was just saying about... Uh, the way it worked for me was just talking to friends that were... Had a, fe- a foot in both camps and had integrated themselves and also uh exploring my worldview which is like what is real what is reality what what is good and bad uh, mm-hmm. what's the meat like what's purpose and meaning and stuff and just attempting to write it all into one thing like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. even if it's not completely there and then updating it accordingly uh that helped a lot so you um, have like kind of like a journal kind of like a yeah journal. i wrote like i just wrote like an article um more like an article, like a kind of an article kind of a thing about where my worldview was at that point. And that just helped ground me and helped me figure out like what I thought was worth doing and why things are good or bad and, and what reality is and some sense of uh, purpose and that sort of thing. Even if it's not completely sure. It helps. I think it, I think it helps a lot. I think that's one of the reasons why I make uh, my videos is oh, yeah. just to help understand. It's, it's almost like I look at it as in like, Every time I like I I have like I write a post or release a video, it's almost like my own um, way of deconstructing my own reality and sense of self, and for me to like remove certain conditionings. It's almost like the videos that you see on the internet of me talking about spirituality. Um, from the relative standpoint, at least that's how I felt like before. It was kind of like there are layers of my my skin. They're they're like the uh, the layers of the mind that I peeled off of and then I just put it on the internet. And then each time I upload a video or upload a new insight, it's almost like, okay, I can let go of that. Mm. And that was a big uh, component of my progression is through that. Mm. Cause you sort of like, when you speak to your, when you speak about it, when you write about it, it's almost like you're, you're letting it be released from your mind. Almost like, it's almost like a, you know, like I said, you're shredding away layers after layers of that onion right, of conditioning and, and, and sense of self because yeah. there's nothing left. Yeah. yeah. So it definitely helps. I think everybody has their own way of, of dealing with this process. And I think expressing it is definitely one of the most important things. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, my progress has been so rapid 
is because of that process. There's a, there's a concrete thing that I could let go of by, you know, doing that. Mm. Whereas if you just let it swim around your head, it's really hard to like really look at it from an objective perspective. Um, and for me to try to attempt to make other people understand what I'm going through, which is so uh, one of my one of my goals in the past is like I wanted the people to understand what I was going through, but at the same time I was trying to make myself understand what I was going through, right? So it's almost like you look at it, you look like your mental state from a really objective perspective instead of just letting it swim around your head. You're writing it down, and you're you know exporting it, and then looking at it from another perspective. Mm. Dumping it. Someone's like mental dumps. Mm. Yeah, yeah, mental dumps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool, man. Yeah, I, I release music. I like write, write, and release tunes, and it's a similar process, actually. Similar feeling, and once it's out, it's like, oh, and it makes yeah. space for the for the next thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, more space for new dumps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah cool man well um there's a few more a few more topics sure, man. And then we can probably bring it to a to a close um one that i was curious about is have you noticed any difference i mean we talked about performance uh and in music and in um at the gym but have you noticed any other health benefits in the body oh, like oh yeah sleep, sleep quality or like i don't know if you if you used to get uh you know get a cold before you know you got to that point or th- those sorts of things or if you cut yourself or you know whatever like how, how's your health uh changed i definitely think i'm like about 100 percent healthier now it feels like that yeah and just like the miso looks younger and you can you can see the transformation of my consciousness and sort of the echoes and how like I love coming the outside. Mm. It's really quite interesting, yeah. And a lot of energetic changes too. Uh, I, I used to have to take sleeping pills almost every night to fall asleep. I would think so much. But then after my May 25th awakening, that's when I stopped taking sleeping pills. Like I could just fall asleep like that nowadays. Um, there's still some nights where I felt like, you know, I could, you know, have a better sleep. If I, like, if, for example, if I have to wake up really early the next day to do some things, you know, it doesn't really hurt to like pop in a sleep pill here and there. But I'll say like 99, uh, 99% of the time, I don't need it anymore. But before it was like, I need it 99% of the time. Wow. And then nowadays, just like, you know, I lay in my bed and I just fall asleep and I wake up, like I get about five or two, four, four, four hours of sleep every night. So I don't need that That's much all. sleep. Anymore. Yeah, like full of energy. Wow. Always, yeah. Whoa. But I'll, I think that after this retreat, that, that kind of died down a little bit. Like I kind of feel like the end, I think a lot of the energy during my previous phase was sort of like a release in conditionings. And I read about this too. I read about how like after you have an initial um, awakening, uh, there was going to be a, there's going to be a period of time where you have a lot of energy and that's because your, uh, your, your body mind is realigning itself, rewinding itself to sort of fit the new paradigm. And for a lot of people, that's a release in your old conditioning. And th- the byproduct of that is that you have a lot of energy. And then I think after that last retreat, uh, I think most of my condition, a lot of my conditions are, are gone, are dissolved. And I don't feel I have as much energy as before this last retreat, but the, the energy is way more like equanimous and way more diffused. Before it was, yeah, I could still sense the, sense the solidity in my body, even though I almost feel manic. Mm-hmm. Um, but now it's just more like it's, it's just, it, it, I, I, I feel way more peaceful. Yeah. Way more peaceful. I still don't get a lot of sleep. I still get about like five hours of sleep every night. But then there was just like this like tightness in my body that was uh, that was pretty predominant you know, before the last retreat uh, for like about four or five months after my awakening that is sort of is dissolved. And nowadays I just feel I, I mean I would say I'm in a much more better state. Although sometimes I I felt like hmm, I was do I, I think I was a little bit more productive back then. There's still there there was there was a lot of like personal motivation that's is really like really dried up now it's mm-hmm. like and it's really it's it's getting to a point where it's really hard to like i think like making videos was one of the last things to go like i don't feel that motivated to make videos anymore but i'm still mm-hmm. gonna do it uh, just like i still practice the violin i still lift weights 
but before it was like uh, the violin thing when like I, I just really had no motivation to become a better violinist, even though I still do it. Uh, I really had no motivation to become a better bodybuilder or to gain more muscles, but I still go to the gym three or four times a week. And then there was still this video editing thing, like producing videos. I was still sort of like pretty deep in my conditioning. But after the last retreat, that's kind of gone. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. in the same camp now. It's like, you know, the violin and the, uh, and the fitness thing. Yeah. But I'm still, you know, I'm still recording. I'm still like, you know, doing podcasts and, you know, I'm still kind of, you know, semi-creating kind of, but I I'm sure it's just a phase. I think after you truly recognize the emptiness and no self, there's going to be a phase after all your conditioning started to dry up that you're going to feel like you don't want to do anything. You're going to kind of like, you know, just chill in emptiness for a while. But eventually that emptiness gets filled up with, with, with fullness. Um, and I think I'm at that phase where I'm really content with just like being nothing. <laughs> But apparently, from the uh, the accounts I read of people's other people's awakenings, that that's not gonna be you know the the end. You know, mm -hmm. the, you're gonna find like new ways to. Uh, I I don't want to say motivate yourself because this, like I said before, this really not not a whole, whole lot of sense of motivation. But like it's, it's there's something something is gonna come up and then you're just gonna go with the flow. But so far, I think I'm in this uh, pretty interesting transitioning phase, where I don't I don't really even feel like like making videos anymore, and that's pretty new. Yeah, mm. but I'm fine with it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm noticing energetically you're you're a bit calmer, and especially yeah. since after after the awakening in the videos, and it's it's just it must be fascinating for you as well that you can just like look back at these different iterations of Frank Yang, and like where Frank. Yeah, Yang it's kind of kind of interesting, but you know there, there was there was a period where I I would like kind of like indulge in that, like look at this transformation, but like even now I'm looking back on it, uh, it's just like. It's not that interesting to me anymore. Yeah, yeah. But it's still it's still interesting. I can still like make something out of it, but but like so far it, that hasn't really popped up yet in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just a yeah, just a couple more things. I mean, um, just a couple of practical things. What's your what's your favorite object of meditation? Uh, the body. body. I think uh, going for body scan is like the cornerstone of my my practice. Ah, interesting. Yeah. I think before my, my second retreat, I never did anything else but body scanning, and I got pretty far. And it was after I got into uh, the first path that I started doing noting and started like depersonalizing like sensory experiences in, in, in reality and other sense stores other than the body. But then that got me to stream entry, just scanning the body. I wasn't even doing it myself in Korea or anything like that. I was just, I was like 99% of my practice was just scanning my body. And to be honest, like 99% of the time, I had no idea what I was doing. But then just by scanning my body, like it, it, it got me pretty far. But then that last 1%, like I had to like supplement it with like, you know, noting, you know, depersonalizing the universe or other sense of experiences and doing some self inquiries and things like that and contemplations. But I'll say, like, body scanning got me to the first stage of awakening, just purely body scanning. And if you look at Goenka's method, Goenka never talks about noting or scanning any other sensations. So apparently, from Goenka's perspective, you can get to the quote unquote, final stage just by doing body scanning. Yeah. But uh, I would right. recommend people still supplement it with some other stuff, but mm -hmm. only if it calls it, only if, like, it, it's sort of like, uh, arise on its own like for me all throughout my whole journey i don't think i, I force anything I, anything that i do was just kind of like there was a calling for it like there was a calling to read daniel ingram there was a calling to discover the pragmatic dharma stuff like it was just happens to be the next door that i open up it wasn't like intentionally almost it was just like hmm, i'm digging down this rabbit hole there's something there's some energetic shifts that were going on just by doing body scanning i was entering jhanas without knowing what jhanas are I started looking into jhanas and I started looking like fruition. What is that? You know, and then I discovered this whole other realm that helped me get through the, the last stages. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, my favorite object of meditation is my body. Yeah. I think that also comes with conditioning from fitness too. Yeah. I'm always like a very embodied physical person. Yeah. 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 That's so interesting because Daniel's mentioned that his is the breath and most sources of information that I've come across recommend the breath. But I find, I personally find the breath harder 
than the body harder to to maintain concentration uh on and there's obviously you know you can do like use there's like all sorts of objects you can use right but okay yeah, that's interesting can, I, I might might have to explore the body a bit more yeah you can focus on deities you can focus on anything really yeah. um and I think I also think body skinny, there's a lot of creativity that could be uncovered through just body scanning. Like there's a lot of different ways that you can scan the body. And for for me the breath was uh kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel feeling about it. was kind of boring. Yeah. And um, I just you know, just you can get into really interesting states just by scanning the body. And and, and uh, Daniel Ingram actually mentioned this. He said that a lot of people go to Golden Kai retreat and they pass their rising and passing away phase. They have like a huge spiritual opening, their Kundalini explodes, and they don't know how to deal with it because in going through retreats, they don't tell you how to deal with it. They don't talk about dark nights, they don't talk about stages, they don't talk about cycles and insights and all that. So that's one of the that's pros and cons about going guys that they did keep the tradition like intact and a lot of good came out of it. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for body scanning for going cut, but at the same time it's it's pretty limited, actually, honestly. Mm-hmm. It's pretty limited. Yeah. Yeah. But there, even though it's limited, the body is, it's a huge field, you know, the, the mind matter phenomena, it's, it's a huge field that you can experiment with, you know, but, but it, it still could be limited. So, yeah. I mean, um, you, you've said just before that you've, um, you're in this sort of chill space now since this mm-hmm. last retreat, but I am curious if there's any sense of what's next for the character of Frank Yang. No clue. No clue. You know, before this retreat, I kind of still had a sense of it. I think it was just old conditioning. I still like, I, I felt pretty passionate about sharing um, some of the new insights about awakening and things like that. In a sense, I, I, was sta- I was still standing on the ground of awakening, but that ground of awakening was dropped on this retreat. Mm-hmm. So in a sense, I don't even feel like there's awakening anymore. It just feels supernatural, but, but at the same time, it's way deeper. Yeah. And I remember Osho said that, um, he said enlightenment is the last ground. It's like, you can still, he said like Buddha was the first being to go beyond the beyond, to go even beyond enlightenment into nothingness. Um, I, I wouldn't say, I, I, I don't know where I am right now, but it definitely felt like there was a ground, like there was the, the awakening ground that I was still standing on. And that was kind of like a necessary sort of springboard to this. And even though I said the shift wasn't quantum, um, even though it's really subtle, it's actually the, because it's so subtle, it's actually more powerful. So I would say like there was a shift, even though it wasn't quantum, it was a big shift actually. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, so even that, that, sort of is not there right now but i don't know it's maybe we'll come back tomorrow who knows so far, <laughs> yeah. I'm not chilling for real it's just like yeah, yeah. i kind of said what i needed to say i, I sort of use that r- space as, as like my own ground not really to co- deconstruct itself yeah. but that last round to like dissolve yeah 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 i'm just i'm just curious <laughs> like i mean you've done your you've done the the bodybuilding and you've done the music and you, now you've done the uh, the meditation, and um, I'm just curious if, if there's like another big project for Frank Yang coming up. No, no clue. Like absolutely zero clue. Yeah, I think maybe I'll become like a CEO or something, like a bank. <laughs> yeah, do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I have no idea, man. I'm just just trying to let it sink in, and whatever arises arises. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet dude. Well, thanks heaps, man. Thanks for coming on and, and having a chat. Really enjoyed chatting to you. And um, yeah, as I said earlier in the podcast, I really appreciate your perspective and the way that you present your experiences. I think it's a, a valuable and very unique voice that you have. So thanks, really man. Appreciate, really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. And all the best. <laughs> all the best with becoming a CEO or, or whatever your next. Uh, next big project is.